In early May of this year, 2023, the celebrated memoirist J.R. Moringer published a piece in The New Yorker called Notes from Prince Harry's Ghostwriter. J.R. Moringer ghost wrote Prince Harry's memoir, Spare, which ended up becoming the fastest selling nonfiction book in the history of the world. J.R. Moringer also ghost wrote two other very successful memoirs, Open by Andre Agassi, which came out in 2009, and Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, which came out in 2016. Phil Knight was the founder of Nike. So, J.R. Moringer has made quite a good living writing other people's books. Um, the piece in question is primarily about his back and forth with Prince Harry, mainly during the pandemic, both while they're working on the book and also after the book is published. But I think it's a fascinating read for any aspiring memoirist or anyone who uh, mm, loves that particular literary genre. I think it does an excellent job defining what memoir should be and makes us wonder or question if a memoir can be art if it's ghost written. First of all, what he, he says this about memoir, which I think is not only on the money, but fascinating, especially the last part of it. He writes, Memoir is not about you. It's not even the story of your life. It's a story carved from your life. A particular series of events chosen because they have the greatest resonance for the widest range of people. A story carved from your life, perfectly said. And I'm fascinated by that last part. A particular series of events chosen because they have the greatest resonance for the widest range of people. I think that every memoirist has to make a decision. We have to decide whether we're writing purely for ourselves or more keeping the reader's desires in mind. Okay, maybe the literary writers lean more towards writing purely for themselves, writing the book that they most want to write or they most want to see published. And the popular writers write more with the reader in mind. And I think there's a spectrum of places where you can draw that line. The best books, without a doubt, are books that appeal to the widest range of people, but also end up being exactly the book that the reader, that the, that the author wanted to write, okay? And I would say that J.R. Moringer's memoir, The Tender Bar, falls into that category, okay? Um, I consider it a great work of art. I would put passages from that book up against anything out there. Um, all the things that he says in this piece in The New Yorker, number one, like I said, about how a memoir is a story carved from your life, or he also talks about how memoir has to be confessional because that's how we know if we can trust the author, if he's willing to get raw, absolutely true. The more raw an author is, the more riveted I am. He talks about how the best memoirists sort of turn outward, okay? They're more about other people. They're not self-indulgently about the author. Uh, he quotes the British poet, uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson, in saying, I am part of all that I've met, it made me think this line, would it be better or more appropriate if it were all that I've met is a part of me? I don't know. 
again, this is the thing about this piece by J.R. Moringer. It makes you think about what memoir is, okay? And then finally, he talks about how uh, it's impossible to avoid hurting the people you love in a memoir and how that type of hurt goes down easier perhaps for the reader if the author is just as unsparing with him or herself. Now, Jeremy Moringer walks the walk. All these tenets, he follows all these tenets in The Tender Bar. The Tender Bar, which came out in 2006 and was published by Hyperion, um, is about, it's a coming of age memoir about growing up in the 70s and early's, early 80s, primarily in Manhasset, Long Island, which is a bedroom community to New York City. Um, he comes from a one-parent family. His father abandoned the family when he was really young. His father was a witty, charming, uh, very successful DJ with a mellifluous voice that J.R. Moringer would listen to at night uh, and be reminded that this uh, very famous, successful, charming man had left them alone uh, to you know, make ends meet themselves. His mother ends up going out to Arizona where she has greater work possibilities. But during the summers and for great stretches, J.R. Moringer returns to Manhasset and is really raised by his Uncle Charlie or Uncle Chaz, who is this, I guess, um, character of a functioning alcoholic who lives with his mom and is a bartender at uh, one of the many very colorful local bars in Manhasset called Dickens, or in later it became Publicans. And there's this ragtag crew of regulars who um, drink with Charlie in the bar. And these are the guys who really teach J.R. Moringer, or the environment of this bar, and all the people who come in there at night really teach J.R. Moringer what it means to be a man. Like what's funny, what's consoling, what's dignified behavior. He learns all of this really in the bar. I mean, there are, like I said, scenes that, unparalleled scenes that I would put up against anything in literature. There's a scene called, I think it's Colt, Bobo, and Joey D, where they reluctantly take young J.R. Moringer, um, these friends of his uncle, Uncle Chaz, they take him out to Gilgo Beach where they get drunk at, they go out to this beach, Gilgo Beach, because it's the only beach in Long Island where they're allowed to drink. They get drunk, fall asleep in the sand, and you know, they have J.R. Moringer read them Breslin from the newspaper, and he earns their respect because of his ability to solve crossword puzzles. There's another great scene where J.R. Moringer loses his virginity on Camelback Mountain in the Poconos. Um, just on top of the mountain at night in the moonlight and the vagina of this girl named Lana is shining in the moonlight. I mean, a stunning images that you would think would be hokey but are not. And then this great scene, I think it's called Bill and Bud, where he's out in Arizona and uh, he's working at this bookstore in a mall. And there are these two, again, confirmed bachelor, bachelors who live with their mother, who are ad addicted in inveterate readers, who want to remain updated on all the contemporary fiction. They spend all day in back reading the new books and resenting customers. So he mans the till. These two guys end up taking a liking to him, they teach him how to read, they teach him how to dress, and they actually end up getting him into Harvard in many ways. So they, it's really this coming of age book about how through failure, through serendipity, he learns what it means to be a good man, a good son, a good lover, a dreamer, Really, it hits, I mean, look, it's not a per perfect book, but what book is, okay? And it's his book. It's his story, all right? 
he became someone with that book. Of course, he had a name before he wrote it. He was a very, very lauded long form journalist for the, New the Los Angeles Times. I first discovered him when I read a piece in The Greatest Sports Writing of the Century, which was compiled by Glenn Stout and David Halberstam. He wrote a piece called Resurrecting the Champ about this boxer called Bob Hatterfield, I think. And it's about this big hitting heavyweight with a glass chin and seeking him out and it becomes this story of mistake and stolen identity and J.R. Moringer is able to dredge up personal issues and put them out there. You really can't read better long-form journalism but nobody makes a living writing long-form journalism these days or very very few people. So the Los Angeles Times changed their editorial policies. He got this great deal writing Andre Agassi's uh, memoir after he'd, you know, blown up big with the tender bar. He writes it, makes a big payday. And then I think in 2012, he came out with a novel, a piece of historical fiction called Sutton. Sutton is, or was, or is, and was about William Sutton, who he calls the most prolific bank robber in America. He had also had a ghost written memoir written about it, right? So the way that Jeremy Ringer describes it in this New Yorker piece is that he wanted to overwrite the ghostwriter of William Sut Sutton's memoir. He wanted to ghostwrite the ghostwriter of a ghost. And so with more rigorous research, he kind of rewrote the story. Anyway, so historical fiction with an experimental approach and it was absolutely ripped by an important critic of the New York Times named Dwight Garner. It's, oh, he writes in a book about how after reading that review, he left part of himself in the hotel room. The book was stillborn. It's a brutal review. I wouldn't call it, I don't know if you could call it cruel, but it's scornful. And, you know, I think it ends with um, something along the lines like J.R. Moringer can do many things. Fiction is not yet one of them. It was a blow to him, all right? Then he gets this offer to write Phil Knight's memoir, Another Great Experience. Um, Again, these other two memoirs that he spends years of his life writing. Um, he puts a lot of work into these memoirs. He talks about her, certain ghostwriters write two or three books a year. He takes two or three years to write one book. Um, you know, there's a point in the book, and this is where the piece becomes, again, fascinating to me and a bit sad and makes me wonder about what perhaps we're losing in contemporary literature, a certain type of literature we're losing. He talks about how he never took a ghostwriting gig for the money. And perhaps he never, he was able to choose his ghostwriting gigs because he had that type of cachet, but he ghost wrote for money. That's clear. He couldn't do it with long form journalism. He couldn't make the money he was making before. All right, so he ghost writes for money. I, I just think he does. And, you know, that meant that he dedicated between 12 and 15 years of his life writing full time with all of his effort and soul, writing other people's books. He talks about how sometimes, you know, the ghost writers have to have big mouths, they have to stand up for the standards of literature. They have to uphold those standards. They have to shore up the publishing industry. And I think that's true. You know, he's shoring up the publishing industry with these books. I have no doubt about it. Mm, but he's getting paid lots of money to be the heir in someone else's trumpet as he writes, quoting William Gass. Okay, so you have this great talent. And J.R. Moringer is a great talent. And he's spending all of these years of his life writing other people's books. 
and it bothers him. And he talks about it bothering him. Like when Andre Agassi is on a talk show and he doesn't mention his name, okay? Or when Prince Harry is giving thanks or taking praise about his book and again, doesn't mention his name, okay? This bothers him. He talks about how ghostwriting is an art. And again, I have to push back on that because I don't really think, look, I guess it's possible. I haven't read Open, I haven't read um, Shoe Dog, I haven't read Spare. I trust that they're fantastic books, but works of art? I mean, if you have a writer, okay, like Jerry Moringer, okay, as talented, as skilled, as experienced, okay, but he doesn't have final say on what goes, okay? It's the celebrities that have the final say on what goes. Okay, so maybe it would be art. If you had a guy like Jared Moringer writing the book and they went through this back and forth of these in-depth interviews, all of this research, okay? It was sent to these, to these celebrities for their approval. The celebrities would give their suggestions, but then, not the celebrity, but J.R. Moringer, if he had final say on what would be published, regardless of what the celebrities wanted, then I think there would be a much greater possibility that it would be art, okay? But J.R. Moringer has to write for money. So what happens to all this great art that was produced by writers who wrote for the money? Great art has been produced by writers who write for the money, okay, who have that popular appeal, who know how to touch that nerve in readers, and at one time, even 30 years ago, could make loads of money do that, doing that. I don't think they can make loads of money doing that now. So what happens? Do they ghostwrite celebrities' books, okay, and they don't have the final say on those books? I really think maybe in contemporary literature today, we're losing the type of literature that great writers wrote for money. I think we're losing that. I really do. You know, it's possible to ghostwrite a book. There is a famous book that was originally published in Spain in 1937 and then was translated to English and it's called Juan Belmonte, Killer of Bulls the autobiography of a matador as told to, that's in the title, in the, in the English version, Manuel Chavez Nogales, okay? Manuel Chavez Nogales was really a precursor to the new journalists. He is probably considered the best Spanish journalist of the 20th century. And he wrote this autobiography of Juan Belmonte, who was perhaps the greatest bullfighter or the most revolutionary bullfighter of all time, and it was a work of art. Chavez Nogales wrote the book in first person, in Juan Belmonte's voice, carried it through throughout the book, and it is a work of art, without a doubt. Not only did he capture Juan Belmonte in this book, he captured a region, a time, a city by impersonating a celebrity, impersonating him. But he had the final say. He decided what would go. Juan Belmonte, in the end, ended up not liking it, ended up mm, saying that it wasn't the truth, which is what celebrities do when they see on the page that their rawness, or wonder if their rawness might strike the wrong chord with their fans and therefore affect their career or affect their legend. And that's what happens, man. That's what happens if celebrities, not writers, have final say on their books. And I just worry that, you know, you know, J.R. Moringer talks about how, you know, he wants to write another novel. He wants to do it. He wants to write a more personal book. I really hope he does it when he's still, you know, firing all, on all cylinders, you know, read The Tender Bar, without a doubt. Read this piece in The New Yorker, without a doubt. And maybe read Open, read Spare, 
read Shoe Dog. Maybe I'm missing out. Maybe they are works of art. But I suspect they're not.